Eugene Farmer is widely regarded as the father of modern finance. There is no behavioral finance. Wait, say that again? There is no behavioral finance. There's no it such It's all just a criticism of efficient markets. The Nobel laureate has been at the University of Chicago since the 1960s and has educated thousands of students. One stand-out assistant who worked with Farmer in the early days was Dimensional Fund Advisors co-founder, David Booth. We had a belief in markets, belief in and how they work uh, based on what we studied here. And said, look, we think we can go out and trade these stocks and not, uh, not get killed. Booth and Farmer's relationship now extends five decades and led to the beginning of Dimensional, a nearly $600 billion institutional fund manager. Every new paper coming out was a landmark paper. It was, it was all brand new stuff and uh, none of it was being applied. The two recently sat down at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, named after David Booth, following a transformative donation in 2008 for a wide-ranging conversation with Barry Ritholtz on a very special Masters in Business. During your last year at Tufts, you worked for Professor Harry Ernst, who had a side gig running a stock market forecasting service. Right. And you did <clears throat> research for him. What sort of work did you do with this stock forecasting research? I was devising schemes to beat the market. And, and, <laughs> and how did that work out? It worked out fine. On the, <laughs> on the data that I fit it to, didn't work out fine on the holdout sample, never did. Mm -hmm. So that was a lesson that uh, data dredging can turn up things that aren't really there. And how did that research into forecasting the stock market impact your thinking about whether or not the market could be beat? Well, when I came here uh, to Chicago, uh, research on asset prices had begun to get going in a really serious way. And many people were interested in the question of how well stock prices adjusted to uh, new information. To put it in context, I always say, it started because of computers. Before 1960, you really didn't have a serious computer to do data analysis on. And with the coming of computers, uh, statisticians, economists were, they had a new toy to, to play with and stock, pre stock prices were easily available. So that was one of the first things they started to study. And then immediately the economists said, well, how do we expect prices to behave if the world was working properly, in other words? if markets were efficient. They weren't using that term, but that's what they were after. And there were all kinds of theories proposed that had lots of shortcomings to them. And a little at a time, we came to the efficient markets hypothesis. And you were, in your senior year at Tufts, you had applied here, but you never heard back from the school. Right. Is this an urban legend, or is this true? No, it's true. <laughs> so, so what happened? Uh, I called, I called in, uh, the dean of students, Jeff Metcalf, answered, that wouldn't happen today. The school is so much bigger, the dean of students doesn't even have a telephone. <laughs> Way too important for that. Mm -hmm. but, so he answered the phone, we chatted for a while, and he said, well, I hate to tell you, but we don't have any record of your application. He said, what kind of grades do you have at Tufts? And I said, pretty much all A's. He said, well, we have a scholarship for someone from Tufts, do you want it? <laughs> And then that's how, I, that's how I ended up at the University of Chicago. So, so you come here as a student. You're, you're finishing your work. Eventually, Merton Miller says to you, hey, do you want to stick around and keep doing the sort of research you're doing? Is, is that how you became a, a professor here? Uh, yeah, I, was, I had offers at some other places. Um, but lots of the places turned me down. They said I was too Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that meant, actually, but the, it was these unacceptable These guys know anyway. exactly what that means. <laughs> but but uh, it was very rare to hire somebody from your own PhD program onto the faculty. There had only been a, one or two before that. So David, you had a somewhat different experience. You grow up in Kansas. You get a BA in economics and a master's from the University of Kansas. What made you decide to come to Chicago? Well, I did a little bit of reading. Um, in finance, um, and um, my, I had a finance professor there that had gotten his PhD here, and he said, finance is exploding, uh, it's really emerging as a, an academic discipline, and it's really uh, one of the, the epicenters is clearly Chicago, 
And uh, so I thought, well, the guy should be fun, maybe he can be a professor. So I applied here and, uh, um, and started to study. Took Gene's class, my very first class. And, and is, was the dean correct? Was that literally 50 years ago? Yeah, 50 years ago this fall. Wow. It was, you know, it, it uh, was the first year that uh, Chicago had a football team in 34 years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you had written about your experience taking a class with Gene. You called it um, life-changing and, and transformative. How, how, in what ways was it life-changing? Well, life-changing <clears throat> led to a career. I mean, <laughs> can't have much of a bigger change than that. Uh, but it's um, life-changing, and I think all, all everybody here probably um, would like to think of themselves as um, having a public purpose. Yeah, at the end of it all, when you get to be my age, you, know, you want to look back and think somehow the world was better off for your having been here. And so these ideas that were coming out, uh, you know, the, the essence of efficient markets uh, was uh, uh, already well developed. He had already coined the term. Um, and you can see this is enormously useful. If you look at the, the way money was managed 50 years ago, people were getting ripped off. I mean, fees were way too high. You know, the commissions were fixed by the government uh, at about 10 times what they are today and uh, well, so forth. It's free today, so <laughs> yeah, pretty it's, much. it's a lot more than a, yeah. a 10x. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I think there was a spirit of uh, uh, that we can improve people's lives, uh, you know, a real purpose to all of this. Now, Gene um, is more on the, the research side, and I've thought, my role in all of this would be more on the uh, application of the ideas. So you become Gene's teaching assistant. How did that come about? I, uh, always, I always picked the best student in the class. Mm -hmm. In the previous year, to be the teaching so assistant. Good student. Next year. Yeah. He was the best of the class. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to laugh at that. I mean, it couldn't be <laughs> <laughs> So, best student. Professor Fama's teaching assistant, why not a career in academia? Well, uh, first off, I realized I could never compete with Gene. I mean, uh, <laughs> when you're at the top of the mountain. And, um, uh, but it's really something, uh, it caused me to reflect, in, you know, really internally, what, what am I about? What do I enjoy? And um, I, I, I just saw this as a great opportunity to go out and apply all these ideas. People were developing. Every new paper coming out was a landmark paper. It was, it was all brand new stuff, and uh, none of it was being applied. So we're going to come back to the application very shortly, but you mentioned that all these new groundbreaking, groundbreaking papers were coming out. Professor Farmer, your doctoral thesis in 1964 was the behavior of stock market prices, and this sentence jumps right off the page. Quote, chart reading, though perhaps an interesting pastime, is of no real value to the stock market investor. So this gets published in the Journal of Business in 1965. What sort of pushback do you get to the general concept that um, charts are of no use, past uh, market walk is of no future predictability to what happens going forward? Well, you got a lot of, a lot of pushback from the professionals. The academics looked at the data, looked at what, what people were saying, what they were showing, and adopted it right away. I mean, there was no pushback among the academics, really. It's really the beginning <clears throat> of, I mean, if you had to summarize really the impact of all this is um, what was going on in Chicago then really changed uh, the way people think about uh, investing. And that's really been the theme. And Gene has changed the way people think about investing more than that's, that's the pre and post line, pre fama and post fama. Yeah. There's a sea change. Wait a not, minute, I don't like the post fama business. <laughs> <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning post publication right. of your work. Yeah, 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 right, right. Right. So, work yeah. so we not only have your doctoral thesis, we mm -hmm. have the efficient market paper, we have the fama French three factor paper. There are a number of very, very influential papers that, David, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that changed the firmament of finance forever. Changed it forever and for the better. I mean, I get, um, particularly in 2019, 
there is, among students, there's this kind of antipathy towards finance and economics, you know, uh, and they don't realize how much uh, finance has changed for the better. People's lives have been improved by these ideas and, and this research. Lower fees, better risk control, and so forth. The truth is, prices are so volatile. Markets have always looked really efficient. They don't look any more efficient than they, than they ever have with the introduction of all the new technology. Back in the days when active managers were dominant, inefficiencies could still be easily found, as could 2% fees. Professionals didn't believe markets were efficient. They thought they were kind of, sort of, eventually efficient. I doubt many of them would say that today. What do you think has changed to bring so many people over to the efficient market theory? Well, <laughs> the accumulation of, of, of performance evidence. So back then, there was, there was no real evidence on how these people did. Uh, and one of the first papers was Mike Jensen's thesis here, which uh, studied mutual funds for the previous 25 years, and showed that basically they weren't beating the market. Uh, and now we know on hindsight that, in fact, that has to be true, uh, that active management is a zero-sum game before cost, because they, don't, they can't win from the passive managers because the passive people hold cap weight portfolios. They don't, rest they don't overweight and underweight in response to what the active people do. So if there's anybody underweighting and overweighting, there has to be another active manager on the other side doing the opposite, which means if one wins, the other loses. So yep. the sum of those is zero before costs. Yeah, Bill Sharp has, has a funny right, way that, of That's it. Bill Sharp's uh, yeah. arithmetic of active management. Mm -hmm. He calls it the arithmetic because it is arithmetic. It's not a proposition. It has to be true. For every winner, there's an offsetting loser. Right. So, what about technology? How does that impact how fast information makes its way into prices? Well, it, sh it should make it better. Uh, but, you know, the truth is, prices are so volatile. Uh, markets have always looked really efficient. They don't look any more efficient than they, than they ever have with the introduction of all the new technology. So, so information is, is spread much more quickly now than it was. 50 years ago because you have so many sources and they're so quick. Uh, but you can't really see in the data that that's had a, a quantum effect on the adjustment of prices to information. So we may not be able to see it explicitly in the data, but when we look at things like hedge fund performance, they did very well before the financial crisis. Since then, not as well. We look at the money flows away from expensive active towards inexpensive passive, it sounds like lots of investors are voting with their dollars that, hey, the market is efficient and we can't beat it. How, uh, doesn't it seem like technology is driving some of that? Because there used to be information asymmetries, there used to be inefficiencies that a savvy manager might have been able to find. It sounds like it's even harder to find those inefficiencies today than 30 years ago. Um, I, I, you have better information than I do because it's. it's You're saying it's, it's the al same. It's always looked hard. It's always been it's that always way. Been, it's always been zero sum game. Yeah, hmm. well, I've been in the business now almost 50 years, and every year people say next year is going to be the stock pickers. It's going to be a stock pickers market. What Gene's saying is it's Can't be. arithmetically <laughs> impossible. <laughs> so so let's talk a little bit about um, index funds. Gene, you introduced David when he is finishing his MBA and wants to go out into the world uh, of work to John McGowan over at Wells Fargo, where they were developing as an institutional product the first index fund. What made you think that that was a good fit for, for David? Oh, well, Mac McQuown, who was in charge of the Wells Fargo unit, came to all the seminars we did here for business people. We did them twice a year. The Center for Research and Securities Prices ran seminars for interested uh, business people, and Mac came to all of them, 
and he seemed very, you know, into the new stuff. And so when it came time that David said, I see what you do, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> As an academic. <laughs> right. So I called Mac and said, I have a really good student here if you've got a place for him. And he, he did. So what was your experience like at Wells Fargo working on that index fund? Well, it was a terrific experience, great exposure. Um, uh, I learned the importance of uh, uh, client work. I mean, uh, the investment business is part technology or investment science, and it's part uh, client uh, work. And as I've told Gene, you know, I studied finance for two years. I've been studying client uh, work for the last uh, 48. <laughs> we got into all this stuff, but we had an even easier argument, which was, look, you ought to hold stocks of large companies and small, and you're not holding small, so we'll give you access to small. So that was the uh, really the sales pitch that uh, put us on the map. Post Wells Fargo, you decide to open uh, this small micro cap fund out of your second bedroom in an apartment in Brooklyn. Tell us how you applied Professor Farmer's research to that micro cap fund. We decided um, not to have uh, run the portfolio like an index fund, even though at first we called it an index fund because it's very similar to indexing, with the final step being um, uh, that we don't trade uh, market on close like many index funds do. Um, and what that means is we, were, we would be trading stocks throughout the day. Well, that created a lot of skepticism, uh, particularly among academics, because you're going to the marketplace, you know you don't have any undiscounted information. People on the other side of your trade, largely institutions, think they know a lot about this stock. You know, why won't they just rip your eyes out when you're trading? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a quite legitimate question. Uh, so what's but, the answer? Well, I mean, the, the answer is there are a lot of things you can do to use the energy of markets and the power of markets to your advantage. And it turns out, for example, if we want to buy a stock, let's say, um, if an institution wants to sell it, their anxiety is greater than ours. So we can use that, their interest in trying to do a quick trade to our advantage and, and uh, protect ourselves. And there's you know, plenty of, uh, of information now floating out about a stock that you can use to protect yourself. But that wasn't known back then. It was just we had a belief in markets, belief in, in how they work uh, based on what we studied here and said, look, we think we can go out and trade these stocks and not, uh, not get killed. But that there were Two, two theses done here on small stock returns, and most of the academics said, well, it looks good in terms of the crisp historical data, but in fact, if you try to trade it, you're going to get swamped by trading costs. Uh, and that was the so-called market microstructure stuff. And then we figured out with, what we found out what dimensional was. No, you really didn't have to, have to pay those big bid-ass spreads that you were seeing. You could go if you were a patient trader, you could do better with, with the prices. So we could deliver the small stock uh, premium. But uh, previous to that, people weren't able to capture the premium didn't because it. of the spreads. <laughs> what, what the academics learned was the market microstructure stuff was garbage, basically. <laughs> they didn't really understand it. So. Now, interesting, uh, uh, what we learned about clients along the way, which was, see, in, in 1981, big, uh, our, our initial clients were all large, the largest pension funds, essentially insurance companies around the world. And they weren't holding the stocks of small companies. <laughs> so really the pitch, uh, we got into all this stuff, but we had an even easier argument, which was, look, you ought to hold stocks of large companies and small, and you're not holding small, so we'll give you access to small. So that was the, uh, really the sales pitch that uh, put us on the map. And so that sales pitch starts to take off and dimensional operating out of your apartment gets bigger. There's kind of an urgent, urban legend that you called New York Telephone to have them add six phone lines, and they refused. They thought you were running a bookie joint. <laughs> yeah. Is that remotely true? Yeah, this was back uh, kind of at the bottom of Brooklyn Heights, uh, uh, bottom of its history. It's, uh, so uh, we started on a shoestring, 
and we ran the portfolio. I was the first portfolio manager running out of my spare bedroom. So I knew we needed more phone lines. So uh, I called up uh, the tel New York Telephone, which was a telephone company at the time. Said I need you know, uh, some telephone lines, you know, six or eight or whatever. <coughs> And they, they thought I was a bookie, so they wouldn't give me the lines. So I had to call up the treasurer of New York Tell, say, yeah, you know, can you send some people down here and give me some telephone lines? And they went around the whole block and found that there were six lines avail available <laughs> uh, in the whole block that, uh, based on their the equipment. And they said, okay, you can have those six lines. And that's how we got started. And the punchline is he becomes a client. Yeah, yeah, right. New York Tell was a client, became a client, yeah. So, so from, from day one, Gene is a board member of Dimensional Funds from the day it launches? Well, even before. I mean, as, once before. we got the, the idea to start the firm, uh, uh, my first call was to Gene, saying, look, you know, it's been 10 years since I was uh, in school. And we, uh, uh, there's been a lot of research. You know, we, we, need, we need to have uh, access to you know, new research and thinking. And would you be on the, you know, one of the founders and and uh, and and be our you know our, our eyes uh, on in terms of research? And he agreed to do that right away. Who who else did you recruit from GSB? So, well, eventually we found out we had to have we wanted to create a mutual fund, and a mutual fund has to have a an independent board of directors. So uh, Rex and I went over the business school, walked into Merton Miller's office. I'm, they still teach Miller Modigliani theorems, don't they? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so Merton was there. We said, uh, you know, yada, yada, small company fund, need independent directors. And um, Merton said, oh, sure. Then I walked out uh, the door and down the hall, and Myron Scholes was coming out of his office. I go, Myron, uh, uh, yada, yada. See, the, the, to Gene's point, this business school was a lot smaller then. And having been in the PhD program, you kind of, Got to know the faculty uh, pretty well. So uh, Myron uh, agreed to join and, and so on and so forth. So it, uh, in fact, until recently, all the independent directors of the, of the mutual fund, our mutual fund, have, been, uh, have taught at Chicago. So well, his, his business partner, Rick Sinkfield, was in my class as well. Mm -hmm. and he was really the first one to put out an index fund, wasn't he? I uh, mean, no, no, no. Uh, it was the first S&P 500 index yeah, okay, fund. Was it? Okay. But, it, but Rex. Actually, that was when I was his teaching assistant. Yeah. He took uh, uh, Gene's class, and Rex was always uh, one of these pain in the neck as a teaching assistant students because he was interested in everything, you know. And uh, so. so, so Gene, you move pretty easily back and forth between academic theory and real-world application of, yeah, of the theories. <laughs> Not a lot of people are able to bridge that gap between yeah. academics well, and the I hadn't, I hadn't been able to bridge it either until <laughs> Dimensional came along. But here it is. It's 40 years later, right, and you right. seem to continue to be... Right, because he, he, um, the reason I couldn't is because, one, it's hard to shut me up. I don't take a party line too, too, too easily. And he, he didn't ever... Although he and Rex never said, would you please do this? What they said was, you do what you do and we'll figure out if we can use any of it. This is the University of Chicago. If they had to look up every time a Nobel Prize winner walked by, they'd get nothing done. <laughs>
actually, um, I didn't have a lot of cash at that time. It was uh, <laughs> it, because we just uh, recently started to accumulate uh, money, got big enough to, uh, but I had stock in the firm, and mm -hmm. so I gave them basically ownership of uh, uh, a big chunk of the, of the stock that I had, and um, they were willing to take a bet on that, and uh, it turned out to be a good bet. And that, that comes with a dividend, which continues yeah. to pay its way to, uh, to, to Booth. Were you at all concerned that you were right in the middle of a financial crisis, giving ownership of a financial firm? A lot of firms did not make it through the financial crisis. Yeah, maybe it ties in with the earlier question about what I learned from here about markets and how they work. And uh, you have to kind of keep in the depth of the financial crisis, you kind of have to keep reminding people you know, markets are where buyers and sellers come together and in a voluntary transaction, both sides of a trade have to feel like they have a good, they got a good deal or they don't trade. They don't trade. So, you know, there's a lot of trading volume activity and a lot of well-known investors investing. And it's just, you know, one of those, um, those comfortable, those markets were functioning the way they, they ought to function. Sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down. Gene, how did David's gift impact the Graduate School of Business? Uh, it was <laughs> it was a, a big lot of cash flow that was not there beforehand, so it, <laughs> it gave rise to lots of research centers, uh, I think, and it made everybody feel as if the future was more or less assured. Um, and the university also got a, a pretty good <laughs> take out of it, so, mm -hmm. as they always do. <laughs> 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 so, David, you tell a, a, a charming story about sitting with the dean, and you, it wasn't your intention for this originally to be a naming gift. They seem to have brought that up to you. Can you yeah, can right. You... No. I said I wanted, um, as for the reasons I outlined, I wanted to, to make a gift, uh, a big part of what I have. Um, and so this is what I want to do. And uh, the dean, Ted Snyder, at the time said, gosh, uh, we were looking to have a naming gift for the business school. This is a lot better deal than that, uh, what we're looking for. So uh, we'll name the school after you. I go, oh, OK, whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so since then, the school has continued to grow in, in both reputation and number of students and the offerings here. Um, and then fast forward uh, five years after that, Gene gets a phone call from Sweden. Let's talk a little bit about that. What was your experience like? Uh, did the phone call manage to reach you? Tell us, uh, tell us what that was like. Well, they, 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 I think they call it uh, early in the noon, morning, right? Noon or one o'clock Stockholm time, which is really early in the morning. I think it's about five or six o'clock. So I don't know. You, you, you never expect to get it because a lot of people could qualify to to get it when you get it. Somehow, they, the people here somehow had. I guess or whatever, I don't know why, because there were newspaper people at my door 10, <laughs> ten minutes later mm -hmm. after, the, after the call. And they wanted to come in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no way. <laughs> but you're on your way to class. Right? Well, I had a class that morning. and You don't, you don't get a special dispensation when well, you win the Nobel you could, Prize, you skip class? You could, but I had never missed a class in all the years I had been teaching. In 50 so, years. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to start now. <laughs> So, and I wasn't going to let anybody in because the kids in the class were paying a lot of money to take that course. <laughs> so, no way I wanted people from the outside disturbing it. So, so we, David, you ended up going to Stockholm with Gene. What, what was that experience like? Oh, uh, it's, uh, um, well, of course, being Chicago trained, I'd, I'd been to the ceremony before with when, when Myron and Bob uh, Merton got their Nobel. So, you know, it's, you're kind of used to this if you. Third you know, time's the charm? <laughs> so. Third, so, third time's the charm, is third that time, Yeah, so, uh, the, uh, so I, I, I said to Gene, give, give me a night uh, to uh, organize something special. So uh, I talked, uh, uh, ABBA has a museum in Stockholm that had just opened, and I talked them into running me out the uh, uh, museum for the evening. So Gene, you know, he has four kids, and that time about eight grandkids, and they're all uh, big music fans, and so, uh, the ABBA Museum has a lot of uh, um, uh, things you can do to have fun, and um, one of them is a, a big stage with a scrim on it, and, and with four ABBA musicians singing, and with a microphone right in the middle, 
And so you, it looks like you're singing with them. And so I look, so this went on. They were the kids. The kids went wild. I looked over at Gene and, and Sally, and they, I could see that they were they were having fun. So it made it special for me. So the whole thing, some people have described as surreal. What was your, it is your surreal. experience? <laughs> the day of the day after. So they had a big event here at the school, really a big event. I mean, with the news and everything. The, wall, the uh, circles around the building were all full of students. Um, and the next day, the Nobel people have a camera committee, and they're following me across the, the Harper Center, uh, the, the big atrium in the, in the middle. And the students are working along the sides. And we walk down the middle. Nobody looks up. <laughs> so we get to the other side, and the television guy says, nobody looked up. And I said, this is the University of Chicago. If they had to look up every time a Nobel Prize winner walked by, they'd get nothing done. <laughs> And, and to show you how true that is, David Booth and Jean and I get in an elevator on four to come down here, and a student gets in wearing headphones, turns around, doesn't say a word to either of you, and the four of us rode down in silence. He was completely oblivious to who was in the elevator with him. So I, I'm always fascinated by that sort of stuff. I'm the most important person in behavioral finance. You are? I am. Why is that? Because most of the behavioral finance is just a criticism of efficient markets. <laughs> so without me, what have they got? <laughs> Value has a tendency to go through these longer periods where growth is beating it. And over the past decade, it's been, if you weren't in big cap US growth, um, you were underperforming. Everything has been um, the S&P 500 when we look at emerging markets, we look at small cap, we look at value. Heaven forbid you're in emerging market small cap value. It's been terrible. What sort of lessons should investors take from this extended period of growth, growth beating value? Well, the, the question they want to ask is, is value dead? OK, let's uh, ask. So uh, the, uh, Ken and I are actually writing a paper on this at the moment. But the, the bottom line is there's so much volatility in these premiums that you can't tell if the premium has changed or, or not. It, it may have changed. It may not. Yeah, you just can't tell. It's, it's, you're well within the range of chance, the experience. The, the, the poor return experience is well within the range of chance over the time that it's, that it's occurred. So. You really can't say anything. So, so uh, there have been other periods of time where value is done poorly. I remember hearing in 98 and 99, this value investor was washed up, this right. guy named Warren Buffett. He doesn't know what he's doing. And typically, when you hear that, it's usually at the end, <laughs> towards the end of that period of underperformance. Um, you're suggesting we won't know for some period of time if the value premium is gone, or if it's just a regular cyclical underperformance? Well, see, I don't think there are real cycles to it. I think it's just kind of random that mm -hmm. you go through good and bad uh, periods. And you, don't, you can't recognize them except after the fact. Right. Uh, you can't really predict them. Uh, we've, we've tried tests. We've tried predictive tests, and they, they have marginal uh, value, no, nothing worth even uh, focusing. Focusing on so basically you're stuck with the volatility of equity returns. They don't allow you to say very much about what's happened to expected returns going forward. And and David, what we've seen a huge proliferation of various factor funds, not just the three factor or the five factor or the seven factor model. There are now hundreds identified. <laughs> what what does this mean uh, for investors? Has has the proliferation of all these new factors been good for investors, or is it a non-event? Well, I mean, I think uh, on balance, um, um, it's been overstated, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, the, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, research has identified, you know, factors that seem to explain differences in average returns, but there can't be hundreds of, of factors. I mean, they got to, they're probably at the end of the day, they're probably a few factors. Uh, and yeah, Gene and Ken, one of the things they try to do is, instead of trying to identify more and more factors, is take the researchers out there and, and can, it. condense it down to simpler, 
you know, more factors that matter. Factors that matter. Well, lots and, of lots of these things are just different manifestations of the same thing. G so give us an example. So value can be very measured in many different ways. I can use the book to market ratio. I can use cash flow to price. I can use lots of different variables to identify what is basically this the same thing. Uh, and <laughs> there are thousands of finance professors out there who all want to get tenure. Um, they have to publish to do that. Uh, so they're all just kind of searching through the data, finding stuff that may be there only on a chance basis. And it won't be there out of sample. So there's lots of work being done, and that remains to be done on ro what we call robustness. How does this stand up when I have new data? So yeah. we, we've always been into robustness in the sense that when we found the in the 92 paper, we went back and collected the data back to, we, that data started in, nine, in 63. We then went back and collected the data back to 26 to look out a sample. And then we looked at the international data to look out a sample. And then we saw pretty much the same thing everywhere. Um, now we've had a bad period of this. But relative to all of that, it doesn't look that, doesn't look that serious. And, and I have to ask you a question about behavioral economics. Um, we're here in Chicago where we could sort of call it the birthplace of behavioral finance. What do you think about that area and, and what's your involvement with it? Well, <laughs> well my good friend Richard Thaler, who is the, the king of the behavioral finance people. And, and another Nobel laureate right. that no one notices. I tease well, him and say, I'm, I'm the most important person in behavioral finance. You are. I am. Why is that? Because most of behavioral finance is just a criticism of efficient markets. <laughs> so without me, what have they got? <laughs> and, and you and, and Dick Thaler are golf partners, right, aren't you? Right. So do you argue across 18 holes? or? No, they, they, no, the reality is we agree on the facts. We disagree on the interpretation. Ah, OK. So um, for example, he thinks the value premium is a result of uh, people's misperceptions of what accounting information and other information looks like. That it's all based on misinterpretation of information. Now, if you believe that, then you think it should go away. Because it's, it's possible to teach people that they have these, these, these biases. Our professional managers should be able to uh, get, get past them. But they still have emotional reactions that Sometimes right, they can't right, right. get by. Well, that, that, <laughs> that, that's the thing about behavioral economics. What, what their studies seem to show is people don't learn from experience. If you're stupid, you're repeatedly stupid. You don't, <laughs> you don't learn. And most people are stupid. I mean, that's the, whole, that's the proposition. Someone has to be on the wrong side of that trade. Right. You said it's a zero sum, right? right. So, so you guys agree more than you, than you might realize. Well, we agree on the facts. Yeah, but not the interpretation. No. But so, there, there, there is no behavioral finance. Wait, say that again? There is no behavioral finance. There's no it such... It is all just a criticism of efficient markets. Really? With no evidence. I, is Dick here? I think he would disagree with that. So well, I'm, let's... I'm not so sure. Because when I, when I put the challenge to him 20 years ago, I wrote a paper that said, OK, now, you've been criticizing us for the last whatever. It's time for you to come up with a theory that we can actually test and see if it works or not. And what was still, his response? We're still waiting. <laughs> well, actually, you presented that paper at, a, at, a, at UCLA. At a, yeah. And Gene walks in and says, on the way over, I was thinking about breaking my leg or something to, so I could catch some sympathy here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be fair, when Thaler won the Nobel Prize, he admitted his plan was to spend the money as irrationally as possible. So even he, <laughs> even he uh, agrees with you on that. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, some of your comments on beta. In 1993, you said beta is dead. Mm -hmm. Do you still believe beta is dead? Well, the evidence basically says that the relation between average return and beta is too flat to be explained by the capital asset pricing model. That's a real shame, because that model is so simple. Um, if it were true, it would really be <laughs> really make, make life a lot simpler in, in, in many ways. Um, but it just has never worked very well. You can have a good career in financial services 
And at the end of it, you can look back on it and take pride in what you've accomplished. It's as simple as that. If the market becomes truly efficient one day, what happens to all of the management firms? That question assumes that markets aren't truly efficient today. How do you respond to that? <laughs> What's the evidence? No, I mean, I, I don't think it's, I, I think all of it is wrong. So it's, it's different. There will still be a management business. Mm -hmm. It just will have very little active in it. So the, the, you have to have some active investors to make price, prices efficient. The problem is you don't expect them to be professional managers because the logic of being a good investor is that you should get the returns. Right. You don't hand them back to other people. You take them back in higher fees. You know, that's a human capital uh, activity is picking stocks or whatever, you, uh, investment management. So if you have real skill, you should be charging. It should all, go, all the returns should go to you, not to your clients. And, and this is for both of you. What sort of opportunity for outperformance do you see in private markets, given that information in that space is so much more opaque yeah. than in public markets? Well, the, the problem is there are lots of good people studying that, but they're hamstrung by the, the lack of good data on people who live and people who die. Mm -hmm. The fund, you know, the managers who live and the managers who die. But well, self-reported, it's not it's like mutual funds where they right. have to report right. it. So you get, you get, a, you get a very kind of biased set of data on that. But you know, it's kind of a, depends on what, what end of that business you go to. If you're looking at managers who actually run the companies that they buy, they may actually be able to add value, but it's management value. It's not stock picking uh, value. If they, you're picking companies that are, have a good idea but are poorly run, probably you can have a lot of value added in that case. But again, it should go to the guys doing it, not to the investors. That's the, that's the downside of that. They're the ones who take all the profits out of it, well, not, not I mean, the that's, investors. That's the logic of human capital, right? right? And we didn't get to a question before I, I have to ask about bubbles. And this goes back to behavior. That's a swear, by the way. But. It, OK, so um, I don't know how to bleep out the word bubbles, <laughs> but. What do you mean by a bubble? OK, so <laughs> folks like Thaler and Schiller would describe a bubble as a period of excessive market enthusiasm that leads prices to far outstrip their fundamental valuation. So what, what's the testable proposition there, though? I don't know. Can you, yeah, well, the way I interpret it is you must be able to predict the end of it. A bubble has to be something with a predictable ending. So it has to be measurable right. by a predefined right. set right. of parameters, right. and you should be able to identify right. the right. end of it. Right. So if they, we were to say. They fail the test every time on that one. Fails the test. Right. I mean, you, you can't, people can't identify bubbles that way. Until after the fact. After the fact, it's, it's easy. But there's this famous story around about you know, the early origins of market efficiency, in which Holbrook working went into the faculty lounge at Stanford. He was, did agricultural uh, prices. And he showed them charts of, of, of prices. And he said these were charts of commodity prices. And he wanted to know, see if they could identify bubbles in the prices. And they, every, to a man, they all could. There were no women. <laughs> to a man, they all could. The problem was what he was showing them was cumulative random numbers. It was, it was all just generated uh, stuff. So that, the message there is people see bubbles where there are none. Uh. So here's a, here's a really broad question. Um, given the societal angst of people attacking the value of a business education, what is your belief in the value of this education <laughs> here at Booth, and how should we communicate this better to society? Well, I think it's, in, in, it's incredibly valuable to society, um, because if we are going to make lives better for people, part of the answer has to come from better and safer financial products. And just That's the reality. And that's been the history. I mean, it's like I say. I look back on my career and uh, working with Gene, and you know we've been part of a, uh, a movement towards lower fees and better controls. So I find it irritating when somebody says, "Really, the only advance in the last 50 years has been the ATM." You know, uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, that was Paul Volcker's quip. Yeah, <laughs> life, 
we've live based on all this work, live we've improved lives, uh, and and other people with sharing the ideas. We're not the only one, but uh, I mean I I don't think it gets much better than that. And uh, so I I would hate to have people um, not get into business or particularly financial services. You can have a good career in financial services, and at the end of it, you can look back on it and take pride in what you've accomplished. It's as simple as that. So, so that leads to the next question. What keeps both of you working? Neither of you have to work. Why do both of you still get up and go to the office each day? It's fun. It's fun. It's challenging. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. I mean, it's exciting to see retired people living better uh, as a result of these ideas or better able to send their kids to college or whatever. I mean, these are, these are not, you know, uh, ideas that have no importance. I mean, these are, you know, that's, you can get behind that kind of idea. You get a lot of satisfaction out of coming up with stuff people haven't seen before or haven't recognized. And we have time for one last question, and I'm going to go with something about um, what do you think the future of Chicago Booth looks like? What is next in store for the school? And this is for both of you. Well, I can tell you that the, so I've been on the faculty since 1963, a student since 1960. In the 60s, basically, there was a pretty good economics group. There was a developing finance group, and that was it. I mean, the rest of the school was junk. <laughs> Right. No, well, but that, we, that was not unique to us. So I remember when I was recruiting as a student um, in college, not, in, not from here, uh, the, the people recruiting said, why do you want to go to a business school? They don't teach you anything. We don't pay anything for, for, what, they, for, for what they do. And that was true at, at that time, I think. And what's happened through time is not just finance, but every other area has been academically made more, become more successful. So, Marketing, accounting, statistics was always pretty good, but it was never part of, uh, of, uh, of business schools. So now we have really front rank faculty in every single uh, discipline. The school is so high, high level competitive on the faculty side, on the research side, that it just bears no relation to what it was 50 years ago. It's, it's a totally different professional uh, place. On the student side, I think there is a challenge and I've been complaining about it for a long time. Students don't work as hard as they did in, in the old days. Ladies and gentlemen, please say thank you to Professor Gene Farmer and David Booth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.